Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you've followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Dute, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Hello and welcome listeners to another episode in the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. I'm your host, Andy Burt, an author of Grief's Abyss, Finding Your Pathway to Peace. And today with my guest, Julie Ryan, we're going to be sharing some ways that you may be able to navigate the holiday season that we're both very aware of can be triggering and can make you want to hide under the bedclothes until the spring. We've both experienced loss and uh, can share if that may be helpful as we carry on our conversation. But before I go down any more rabbit holes, let me introduce our guest, Julie Ryan. Welcome, Julie. Thanks, Miss Anne. I'm so delighted to be with you. Uh, I am absolutely thrilled because I don't know when we were planning this and you said November the 17th, that's when I can do it. And I went, okay, Fridays are usually a good day for me. We booked it. And then it was, as I'm preparing, I recognize that it's 12 years to this day that my dad died and it took me because of him. I blame him. And I, I tell him off frequently that I went on this journey in, into a uh, grief land. I mean, it, it's so interesting when you look back to see how your lives evolve, isn't it, Julie? It is. And this day too, and I didn't think of it when we were planning that, but this, but we were talking about it before we started recording. Today is the 13th anniversary of my little sister's unexpected death. And we buried her on her 50th birthday. And it was heart-wrenching, just awful. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's no coincidence, no coincidences in life ever. And you know that, that I think your dad and my little sister, Joan, we're up in heaven going, okay, ladies, do it on the 17th on the day that we're recording. Just in case you forget me, daughter, I'm still very much present in your life. Here we go. Yes, I'm sure that the two of them are up there. His name was Art. So thank you for presencing your sister because I always like to presence them in into our conversations so because of the day being so close to Thanksgiving and then Christmas we can both speak to the difficulties we have faced but what might be some of the triggers that our listeners may come up against? Oh, I think there are many. I think all the memories of childhood and then adulthood when we were with our loved ones when they were still around. And and I I find that I use a lot of Christmas decorations, especially, and I do have some Thanksgiving decorations as well that were my mother's and my grandmother's and my sister's. Mm -hmm. And I cherish having them. So I'll bring them out this time of year. And it sometimes will evoke some tears in my mm -hmm. eyes. I mean, I'm getting, we'd be just even talking about it yeah. as far as, and then I think, okay, not only are they here with us in spirit and we can communicate with them and I can talk about an easy way to do that if you want in, but yeah. we have all of these memories in the form of, for me, Christmas ornaments or pictures from Christmas's past and also Thanksgiving where we were together and we, we just create new memories. You know, those memories don't go away, but we add to those memories mm. and we can toast our loved ones 
that aren't with us in physical bodies anymore. We can say, hey, here, you know, happy Thanksgiving, mom, or or happy Christmas, Susie, or whoever that you want. And I and I think that that is really a wonderful thing to do because it lets everybody remember our loved one and know that they're with us in spirit. Mm. Oh, I think that's beautiful. Did you find, Julie, you say that you were able to... Uh, decorate the house with ornaments from grandma from mum, and and your sister's ornaments did you find that you were able to do that that year or did was that a bit of a process before you actually got to do that no I did it that year when especially when my sister died and and this was so interesting she died very unexpectedly and was in ICU for several days on a ventilator, never regained consciousness. Mm-hmm. But I could I could communicate with her telepathically because I am a medical intuitive and psychic medium who learned how to do woo-woo. I'm a businesswoman who learned how to do woo-woo. I say I'm a buffet of psychicness. So I was communicating with her telepathically while she was in ICU and, and unconscious. But After she died within, oh, probably half an hour or so, my brother-in-law came out and we were waiting for the funeral home to come get her body. And he said, your sister has always wanted at her funeral. She's told me for 15 years, she wants everybody to get a Christmas ornament. And I Mm. said, what? And he said, yeah, she wants everybody at her funeral to have a Christmas ornament to remember her by. And now this is, she died on the 17th of November. Her 50th birthday was on the 19th of November. So two days later. Yes. And he said, we're going to do the visitation. We're going to have a wake on the 19th. Can you make that happen? Well, I was out of town. Yeah. I mean, I didn't live there, hadn't lived there for decades. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to make this happen. So within less than 48 hours in, I assembled with help 350 Christmas ornaments. They were pink balls and they had her initials calligraphied, you know, her monogram in white paint on these pastel pink Christmas balls. And they all had a pink satin ribbon on them. Mm -hmm. And then my goddaughter, thank you, God, was a party planner at the time who lived three hours south of where I was in Columbus, Ohio, I said, meet me at the funeral home at 9 a.m. with two pre-lit Christmas trees and all these Christmas ornaments. So I paid more to FedEx in all those Christmas ornaments overnight than I did for the ornaments themselves. So it was such a beautiful thing that everybody got an ornament. Mm -hmm. And, And the other thing that I did too at the funeral home was, it, it was a mob scene. There were hundreds of people there because my family has lived in that town for five generations. Oh, I God. had six great big, huge birthday sheet cakes, birthday cakes. Oh. And I had yes. all her girlfriends as hostesses and everybody that came to that funeral home got a Christmas ornament and they got a piece of birthday cake. Oh my so, goodness. So you did the two together. The I did the two together. So I came home couple of days later after the funeral with my husband and my son. And I had a little uh, tree in an urn in the corner of my Christmas. And you better believe I took my fill of those pink ornaments with her monogram on them. Uh And I decorated that when I got home. And so for Thanksgiving, it was already decorated with all of her ornaments. And still 13 years later, they're still all on that tree in my kitchen that's lit up. Oh my goodness. I have a you remembrance that tradition going. every year. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful memory. And you were able to do that. What about your grief? How did you work with that, Julie? Well, interestingly enough, and I think it all works out the way it's supposed to. Mm-hmm. My, I had 17 people coming within less than 48 hours of when we got home for Thanksgiving. And they were all coming in from all over the country. And so I didn't just have to feed them on Thanksgiving. They were all staying at our house and at local hotels. It was my husband's family. So I had to feed them for multiple days. So I'm on the phone on the way home in the car, you know, organizing meals and doing stuff like that. So I was really busy. And I think it helped a lot that I had all that activity happening when I first got home because it was such a shock. 
that she had died in such a, an excruciating few days. So then once that all cleared and I was decorating for Christmas, I cried a lot. You know, I, it, it was the opportunity for me really to have a moment to grieve. And I felt like the things that I had that were family memories and also as I was decorating for the holidays, it helped me grieve because I find, and I don't know if you have too, Anne, that sometimes we just need something to be the catalyst to let us release those tears. And then they just come in buckets and waves and all of that. I will tell people that tell me that they can't grieve. They'll say, I, can't, I don't have any tears. And I know it's all stuck. I'll say, watch Terms of Endearment or a sad movie. Yeah. And you're going to cry at the movie. And it's like it loosens up those tear ducts and then it just flows. And it's a good way that can be a catalyst to help us begin the grieving process. So that is one way. If you find that you're unable to grieve, watch a sad movie and really get into it. And I think so many people are afraid of those emotions because they're big. Right. We we've spent our lives controlling them and manageable. And all of a sudden it's almost as if the guard has been let down and the floodgates have sort of opened up. Uh, but you're not gonna drown if you no. allow yourself to be and sit with the emotion. It will pass, won't it? It will. And and what I teach too, and and this is works very well for me. And and I have many clients and people that listen to my show that tell me that this works well for them when they're grieving. I always say, picture the ocean, picture waves of the ocean. Everything in life has three stages, calm, disruption, repair. You know, you think about the seasons, it's calm in the summertime, you have disruption in the fall and the winter, and then you have repair in the spring. Well, waves of the ocean are the same way. The ocean is calm, and then you have a wave that'll come crashing in, that's the disruption. And certainly if there's a hurricane or there's snarky weather, you can be injured. I mean, it can hurt if you get in the waves and you get knocked over mm -hmm. from a powerful wave. But always remember that it's going to recede and it's going to go back and the ocean's going to be calm. So when you feel those waves of grief, and that's what it feels like, I think, mm -hmm. is a wave of grief that sometimes just comes over us for no reason. Yeah. You know, we'll hear a song or we'll see something or a, something will trigger a memory and then we'll just find ourselves boohooing about exactly, it. Yeah. Picture the ocean, let mm -hmm. the wave come in, let it come to shore, let it wash over you and know it's going to recede. Mm -hmm. And then another wave's going to come later. Expect them. They're going to come, let them flow, picture them flowing back out. And then over time, those waves become less frequent and less powerful and the grief lessens with time. So what I'm hearing you say, I love that analogy, the ocean, just as you're talking about it, I could almost feel my body calming down. And that is the purpose in a way, is it not? To have our bodies calm down because when an event such as a sudden death has happened, you're in that state of shock. And then slowly the body believes that you can handle a little bit more. I, I kind of liken the shock to a blanket protecting you. And slowly that warm blanket drops so that you are then faced with the enormity of what's happened. And that to me is when people possibly can get into problems because all of a sudden they're feeling it all, whereas before they've been numbed. So if they can just remember to picture the ocean, mm -hmm. that'll bring the stress levels, that'll bring all the cortisol, that'll bring you back into feeling grounded because the brain doesn't know the difference between danger or a calming moment and if you're all of a sudden visualizing the ocean you are then naturally going to 
the danger signals are going to go, okay, we're thinking of an ocean. We can't be planning our escape. We don't need to run anywhere. So it's going to bring you back into that calmness. I Absolutely. Love- Absolutely. And and I think you've hit a really important point, in too, is that when we're in fight or flight, and every time we have a, a an emotion that feels bad, mm-hmm. it's always based in fear, whether that be grief, anger, boredom, jealousy, whatever, actual mm-hmm. fear. It's always based in fear. And to your point, the body doesn't know the difference between a real fear and a fake fear. The other thing that happens when we're in fight or flight is we lose clarity Mm -hmm. because the blood drains from our brain, goes to our heart and extremities so we can run away from that grief as if it was a, you know, some kind of tiger that was chasing us. And it's not, but the body doesn't know any differently. So when you picture the waves of the ocean, what happens is it can keep you out of that fight or flight physiological response. I have another technique that I teach that I'd love to share with everybody, if I may. Yes. I call it the two minute rule. Mm. And here's how it goes. Every thought that comes into our head is neutral. We assign it a meaning. So when we have a thought of, oh, um, my sister, like for me, oh, my sister's not going to be able to be with us for Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving is ruined. And then we're on this wavelength, kind of this radio channel of more of those thoughts. Well, if they, if my sister's not going to be there, then Thanksgiving's ruined, then we don't need to bother being with family and we don't need to do all that work and, you know, all that planning and everything for Thanksgiving. And we get all this black hole of Mm -hmm. thoughts that makes us feel worse. Well, that's not rational. That's based in an irrational fear that's false. Whereas if we can ask when we have that thought, If my sister's not with me for Thanksgiving, is that going to kill me in the next two minutes? It's a yes or no answer with this game. Mm, Is it it, whatever the situation is, my turkey's burned. I've got, you know, I'm going to be late for this meeting, whatever. Okay. Is this going to kill me in the next two minutes? It's a yes or no answer. 99.99999% of the time. It's going to be an irrational fear that we're stressing over and we're using our imagination to envision things we don't want to happen. So when you ask that question, what does it do? Curiosity snaps you to a different channel. It immediately raises your vibrational level because curiosity is interesting. It's fun. You want to know more. Absolutely. And the beauty with the two minute rule is you can use it unlimited times in a day and you can mm-hmm. use it in any situation. It's free and it's convenient. It works anywhere your brain is and your brain's usually with you wherever you are. So you just ask yourself, whenever you have a thought that feels bad, is this going to kill me in the next two minutes? Yes or no. That will keep you out of fight or flight. Now, if the answer is yes, this could kill me in the next two minutes, get out of the road before the truck runs you over. That's a rational fear, but the two minute rule is just magical. Oh, I like that. That um, that certainly makes sense because in the grief itself, your brain is attempting to make sense of what you're experiencing and what has happened. So you tell yourself stories, which is the fear, isn't it? It kind of doesn't like unfinished business. So it's going to make those stories up which is going to provoke the stress and anxiety within you. So stop, visualize the ocean, and then ask yourself, when you have clarity, your brain is back online, is this going to kill me? Oh, what a brilliant suggestion for... Even even before you have clarity, when you're in panic mode. Oh, yes. If you you can ask, do it. As it snaps you out of that, just make it a habit. It snaps you out of, of that fight or flight. It gives you perspective. It gives you clarity. And I always say we're being led all day by our deceased loved ones, spirits, and by our angels and saints and God and the whole universe, you know, not necessarily in that order. But but what happens is when we're in grief or we're, we're in a some kind of an emotional state that feels badly in... We're out of alignment with our spirit. It's a low vibration. And I always say spirit doesn't communicate on the I feel crappy channels because the (laughs) vibration's too low. 
So when you ask, is this going to kill me in the next two minutes, it immediately raises your vibration. Then spirit can give you guidance. Mm. You can have guidance come in of, well, if I'm late for this meeting, okay, I don't have to panic. I just have to text somebody or call somebody. Mm. Say, hey, I'm stuck in traffic. And we and we're gonna laugh a lot when we use the two minute rule because we'll have a thought that'll come in and and I'll I, I don't even think about it now I just go to the two minute rule it's such a habit with me but I'll say to myself oh for God's sakes girl quit being such a drama queen and you're gonna laugh a lot so it works it's great thought of being a drama queen going back to um, those thoughts. When somebody has died, I don't know if it's a society belief, but it's something within us. We feel we need to be um, sad or we can't feel joy. Where does that sort of fit in? Because the way you're explaining it, that is not a truth, is it? That is something that we impose on ourselves. Yeah, well, it's learned. It's a learned behavior, absolutely, from families and from society. And and I think the key here is to know that that our loved ones are not gone. They've just changed. They've changed their for, their structure, their mm-hmm. spirit without a body. And spirit without a body vibrates faster. You know, everything's energy. And spirit without a body vibrates at a higher frequency, at a faster frequency, because it doesn't have the density of the body to Mm. slow it down. So knowing that we can communicate with spirit at any time, any spirit, whether we knew them or not, is irrelevant. Any spirit that's attached to a body, they don't have to be somebody that's passed. So all you have to do is just say, hey, mom. And then that our heads are big satellite dishes in, and they Mm. receive and transmit frequencies. Every spirit has a frequency they keep throughout all of their lifetimes. So you want to talk to your mom, your mom or your dad. Let's talk about your dad. Today's the anniversary of his passing. Hey, dad, that tunes your satellite dish head immediately to his frequency. It's like you're you're changing the dial to the dad channel. Okay. And then and rid of all the static and that's right. Raising your vibration so that they can come in clearer is that that's what- right and then you it's as if we're opening a two-way radio communication mm. and you say something to him either in your mind or aloud and he's going to answer you in and it's going to come in as fast as you can snap your fingers or before if you think about it for more than a second the thought that comes into your head that's your brain talking to you the more you do this the more validation you get, the more validation you get, the more you trust it, and then it just becomes second nature. We all come in with the ability to communicate with spirit. Every one of us, every human ever born, little children do this all the time. Yes. For and sure. it's there are unlimited stories about some three-year-old who sees his grandfather in his bedroom at night and he mm-hmm. tells his mom the granddaughter, things about his grandfather that he, there's no way he could know. He never met him. This child can't read yet. There's no way he could know him. All children communicate with spirit until the age of about, it's been my experience in about seven or so because they've had their grownups in their lives say, oh, honey, that's just your imagination. That's not real when it is. So all we have to do is just think of them. And when people are grieving, I find an easy way to communicate with your deceased loved ones is ask them to meet you in your dreams. Mm. Before you go to sleep at night, just say, hey, dad, can you meet me? Even if you want to meet him in a specific place, that's good. Can you meet me at the lake, you know, down at our cabin? Can you meet me in Tahiti? Can you meet me in wherever? (laughs) Wherever was that favorite place or yours. Right. And it's easier for spirit, I have found over the years, and to communicate with us oftentimes when we're in our sleep, because all of us, our bodies and our spirit resets to a high vibrational level when we sleep at night. It's like Mm -hmm. we go back to the factory (laughs) pre-setting. And so back to spirit communicates on the high vibe channels. Well, we're back to the high vibe channel when we're asleep and then spirit can communicate easier with us. 
Whereas during the day when we're in grief, it's hard for them to reach us and it works great. So that would be a great idea is to perhaps write in a dream journal, your loved one's name, please come to me in my dream. Or as you say, meet me in this specific place. I just, as you were talking, I quickly spoke to dad and he asked me, why are you not painting? Why did you let your art go? <laughs> for you? Yeah. So what's your answer? My answer is because it made me cry. Oh, oh. <laughs> I remember my husband bought me a fabulous uh, box of paints. My dad was an artist. I've got his artwork all around. And um, I was mixing this color and it was really lovely. And I ran out of it and it was getting dirtier and muddier. <laughs> and it was like... Why didn't I pay attention to my dad? Why didn't I listen to him more? He could have taught me, you know, how to mix these colors. So anyway, I'll have to pick those back up again. Well, I think that's a really good point, Anne, because you can talk to him now. He can still teach you now. He can, yes. Yeah, so can. Yeah. Meet me in my dreams. So get not, well, not only meet me in my dreams, you were just talking to him. Just say, hey, dad, what colors do I need to mix? Show me in which... Oh. In okay. what quantities do I need to combine the blue and the yellow to get aqua or whatever? Okay. And, and I think that's the thing, Anne, that's so fabulous about being able to communicate with spirit is any information that you want, all you have to do is ask. You can ask a loved one who's deceased. You can ask a saint. You can ask just the universe. Hey, what what combination do I need of blue and yellow and green and whatever else? to get this aqua color that I'm trying to, to make. And they've got the color you're seeing in your brain. They can so, see it. Yeah. yeah. So that's one of the best ways to do it. And, and you think about, oh my gosh, we have access to any information that we want anytime we want it. We just forget that we have that opportunity. And that's why they say, stop looking externally for the answers. We've got them internally. And that would be a validation of what you're just saying. Okay, I'm going to try that, listeners, and I'll certainly uh, stay tuned for more updates. I have another suggestion, too, if I may, real fast. <laughs> Please, yeah. Okay. Uh, Perdita Finn is a friend of mine, and she's been on my Ask Julie Ryan show. And she's a historian and, a, and an amazing writer about primarily histor history of women healers and women that were telepathic and you know and were the were the ones that really made the magic in the world and she every morning before she gets out of bed and she and her husband lay in bed and they do their morning prayers and then she assigns tasks to her deceased loved ones she'll say okay mom i need you to find me this kind of plant dad I need you to help my son because he's going in for an interview with this job and, you know, please be with him and give him, she gives them tasks, a whole bunch of them. And then, and she said, every one of them comes to pass. Wow. She said, yes. they're all eager, including her guardian angel and, and saints and people that she didn't know. She said, they're all eager to help. They just need us to make requests and be specific if we can. And she said, it is amazing how well that works. So, so there you go. Another wonderful tip. I know we tend to think uh, the common thing is, oh, just get your angels to find you the perfect parking spot <laughs> so that you can zip in and out the store that you, you want to be going at. But I, I like that, assigning them so it's almost as if you're connecting with them and you're continuing those threads. They're no, they may not physically be there, but energetically you're still very much connected. And I find that brings me, knowing that, a lot more comfort. So this is something, if you are grieving right now, listeners, that you can practice. And you don't have to be sad because your loved one isn't in your life, but perhaps celebrate, as, as Julie said, with um, something that you know is meaningful for them. 
And I know you go into the stores, it's absolutely cluttered with Christmas thing, even though it's Thanksgiving for you coming up in the States. And Christmas music will start to play if it's not already. And that can be very triggering. That can be one of those triggers, can't it? How can we navigate those when we're out shopping for groceries? Two minute roll, baby. You're in Too the store <laughs> and, and those Christmas carols are playing. And there's, I, I was in a store the other day and they had 40 foot tall inflatable Santas and Christmas trees and stuff like that. My husband loves that stuff. I sent him a video. I said, honey, here's what Christmas in heaven is going to look like for you. Cause I won't let him in my yard. So anyways, I digress. I knew there was the reason I liked you, Julie. I'm so, the same. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I love Christmas decorations, but I don't want plastic inflatables. I want something a little more classic. So uh, you're in the store and you're hearing Christmas music and you're feeling like, oh, my mom or my child or my whoever isn't going to be with me. This is going to be the hardest Christmas ever. And you're hearing those Christmas carols and it just triggers you. You ask yourself, okay, I'm hearing Christmas music. Is that going to kill me in the next two minutes? Mm. You're inside of the grocery store? No, it's not. All right. And so you stay out of that fight or flight and then you can get guidance. And maybe the song comes on that was your mom's favorite song. And you can think, okay, mom, thanks. No coincidences in life. Mom's making that song play for you. It's all about our perspective. And if we can stay out of the fight or flight with the two minute rule, again, you can use it in any situation, anytime. Any place, unlimited times a day, it's free and it's convenient. Two-minute rule works in every situation. So whenever you're out shopping and you hear a favorite song rather than go into that emotion, the two-minute rule, is there a danger of what they term spiritually bypassing your emotions by doing that? Is there a time where you really need to sit and have a darn good cry. Well, absolutely. No, I think that's absolutely necessary and therapeutic, but it may not be in the, you know, in the in middle the of the grocery store, in the pickle yeah. aisle in the grocery store. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, that yes, when we can do that and we can have the opportunity to grieve and pay attention to those waves of the ocean and it's mm -hmm. going to come in, and you're going to walk around for a long time, perhaps feeling like, oh my gosh, the world is happening outside, but inside, I kind of feel like I'm walking around inside a barrel or something. Mm -hmm. That's all to be expected. Certainly there are phases of grief. There's no right way or wrong way to grieve. Somebody's going to grieve for one person may grieve very quickly. Somebody else may take years to grieve the loss of a loved one. But the thing that's most important is know that your loved one's there in spirit and ask them to send you a sign. Mm -hmm. Spirit communicates in symbols and signs and music and phrases. And you may see a license plate. You may see numbers that are all the same on a clock, like 111 or 444 or something like mm -hmm. that. I see hawks a lot. Hawks are divine messengers. Yes. And I'll see a hawk and then I'll say to the hawk, what, you got a message for me? Kind of like a carrier pigeon. Hey, yeah. you got a message for me? <laughs> that kind of thing. So be open to how your loved ones are going to communicate with you to let you know that they're with you. Mm. And if you're in deep grief, try the talking to them before you go to sleep at night. You don't, you don't even have to write anything down. Just say, hey, dad, yes. come visit me in my dreams. Yeah, as simple as that. Because I've heard so many people, they've heard that somebody else has had a sign, ladybirds, monarch butterflies, cardinals, blue jays, rainbows. There's a whole slew of things. Yeah. My daughter and I get little orbs on pictures. Yeah, yeah. And if you blow those up, Anne, sometimes you can see faces in them. Can you really? Yeah, it's really fun. I had and I have thousands of stories of yeah. working with clients and we're talking with their deceased loved ones. And I had I had two that come to mind. One just happened recently. And I think this is a great illustration of be open to how it's gonna happen and when they may give you something that hasn't happened yet. 
Ah. I was talking with a client and her deceased husband, and she lives in Boston. And she said, does he have a sign that he can send to me? And she said, um, and what I got was, yeah, look for the peacock. And she said, peacock? I live in Boston. We don't have peacocks here. Whatever. I said, just be open. You might see a pin. You might see a picture of a peacock. You might see a peacock, peacock on a movie, whatever. Mm-hmm. As soon as she got off the phone with me, and she turned on her computer and went pulled up her Facebook page, and there was a picture of this huge full color peacock. <laughs> so that that's her husband going, "Honey, I'm with you." My other one just happened last week. A, a graduate of my class, her mom had passed a few days before, and so my gal Angie was fixing dinner for her family, and she was in the kitchen, and she watched a spoon fly across the room. And her brother was there and they both looked at each other like, oh my goodness, what is this? And she said to her mom out loud, mom, isn't that a little dramatic to make this food fly across through? And and, and then she said, I figured out my oven was on fire. Oh, and so so she said, so we, we put out the fire. And then I said to mom, thanks, mom. I know why you needed to do something dramatic to get my attention. Oh my goodness. That's one of the wilder ones I've heard of. Yeah, for sure. I know when mom shortly, well, the day of her funeral, we're all sitting in the living space and the lights start flickering. And these lights have never done that. And without even considering it, I just turned and I went, oh, hi, mom. Welcome. Uh, You know, we're all here. Glad you could come. And it was just one of those moments And then another time when we're talking about that is just to create an awareness. I was doing my book signing and I had a big event and I was chatting about it and I had a great big six foot picture of my book and some somebody taller than I had secured it. And all of a sudden it started to roll up and without thinking, I just went, I guess my dad's present. (laughs) So I suppose it's, Not allowing your brain to assign a meaning to any of those, but just allow what needs to come out of your mouth. Well, and those are two really good examples, I believe, Anne, of when the lights were flickering, the first thought in your head was, oh, mom's here. And when your signs started growing up again, the first thing in your head was, oh, my dad's rolling up the side, my dad's here. So it is, I'm telling you, as fast as you can snap your fingers or before, that first thought that comes into our head is always divine guidance. It's always intuitive information. And then what most of us do is we discount it and we say, oh, there must be a short in the wire or there must be a power surge or there must be something instead of what your first thought was, oh, mom's here. And that's exactly true. You were exactly on target. So go with it, listeners, if that is something that you are experiencing. I know we're almost out of time. We've spoke about how to help our listeners navigate the holidays, the two-minute rule, the ocean, uh, some of the triggers, our senses are the ones that smells will bring up familiar memories, uh, hearing the music. But as you said, you can assign a different meaning to it just by asking in that two minute rule, is this going to kill me? And then perhaps when you get back to the safety of your home, put on that music, recreate that smell, whatever it was that triggered that memory and just have a good ugly cry, I guess, to help you release it so that it doesn't get stored in your body. Is there anything else we haven't covered, Julie? Because I've got another question I want to ask you. Well, I think that we're all here to create. And part of what we're here to create, the bottom line is create a life of joy. And our loved ones, when we talk with them, they don't want us to be sad. They're Mm. around us all the time. I've talked to tens of thousands of spirits over the years, communicated with them and gotten validation for stuff that they tell us. And the one thing, the one common denominator, Anne, is they want us to be happy. They want us to ask them for help. They're here to assist us. Mm -hmm. And the thing that they love is they can be everywhere all at the same time in spirit form. So when we're focused on, oh, my dad's not going to be with us for Christmas. It's going to be so awful. And well, your dad's 
in heaven go, you know, and around you saying, yeah. what do you mean not with you? I'm with you way more now than I was when I was alive. I'm going to be there every step of the way. I'm going to be there when you wake up on Christmas morning with you. I'm going to be there, you know, as you're cooking breakfast, as you're doing everything else. And all spirits are pure love and pure joy. And that's what they want to share with us. So ask them for things like you said, and know that they're around you and know they can hear you. They don't read our minds. Mm -hmm. But we can ask them for things. They see that as an invasion of our privacy and our free will. Okay. Okay. But when you ask, it's when you ask, invitation. you know, the the old ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. What a novel a, concept. Yeah, ask. yeah. Just yeah. ask. Ask. <laughs> exactly. So it sounds that the grief is there for a reason. Any thoughts on that? Why? I, I know it's an attachment, but why do we feel that loss so deeply? Is it a soul um, that needs to heal? Because our mind can easily have us move along. It's our heart. Is it our soul? What What are your thoughts there, Julie? Well, the first one that came into my mind, Ian, is we're here to have the human experience. Yeah, we're here okay. to experience all those emotions mm. and then create out of them. When we know what we don't want, it helps us create what we do want. And that's why we all incarnate is to create. Okay. And then, and it never ends because what happens? We create during our lives all day long. You know, you create getting out of bed, you create, what are you going to wear? What are you going to have for breakfast? We're creating all day long. And yeah. then we create lots of things in our lives. And then when we're done, we die, we go to heaven. And what do we do? We create whatever it is we want to explore and experience in the next life. <laughs> so it never ends. So we're here to create. And if we didn't have the contrast, we wouldn't know what mm -hmm. to create. If you know what you don't want, it helps you create what you do want. That's number one. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other thing too, is all emotions that feel bad are all based in fear. Mm -hmm. And the fear is when we have, when we lose a loved one is I'm never going to see them again. I'm never going to be able to talk to them again. I'm never going to be able to, you know, share memories and share new adventures and things like that. And that's just not right. It's, it's, yeah. it's a, it's something we've been taught. That's just not true yeah. because we can communicate with them telepathically all day, every day, as mm -hmm. often as we want. We can create new memories because they're with us. We can ask their opinion and get answers. I mean, all of that, it's just different. It's a different form mm. in which we're creating, but nevertheless, we're still creating. Still creating it. So for anybody that is grieving and they feel that they cannot be happy, those would probably be the learned behaviors, but also their thoughts of being judged by others. And I think this is why it's so important. As you mentioned, everybody grieves differently, whether somebody's crying or not, not to judge them, just to allow, just to comfort them, however you feel drawn to do it. But I always caution about the judgment to yourself and to others. Well, nobody can control anybody else's thoughts. Yeah. And nobody can control our thoughts. We're the only ones that can control that. We're the CEO of our bodies and our brains, right? No, <laughs> we, you know, we, we have people that help us, <laughs> but, we, but nobody can control what we think or what somebody else thinks. So just come from a place of compassion for mm. somebody who's grieving. And, and to your point with judging, say, well she hasn't grieved the loss of her father yet because she walks around smiling all the time. You don't know what she's doing when she's home. That's true. Yeah. You know, and maybe she chooses to live a life of joy and she's talking to her dad and, and it's, and it's working out great. There's a gal that I'm interviewing actually this afternoon on my show, who's done research that shows the best way to heal grief with a, a loss of a loved one is to, communicate with them telepathically. There's been university-based research done on that. It's the it's the way that 
provides the most comfort. And anybody can do it. You don't have to go to a medium. You just ask your loved one a question. And it's that first thought that comes into your head. And so, so we sort of all uh, can do that. Demonstrated, yeah. Oh, I love that. So to heal your grief, just talk to your loved ones. Talk to your loved ones. They're, Absolutely. They're now, you have an amazing book because a lot of people will perhaps still have it in their head. Well, they died alone. They suffered. And in your book, you have amazing, well, I'll let you share. Yes, absolutely. Angelic attendance, what really happens as we transition from this life into the next. And we have we have illustrations. I think that's what you were referring yes. to. We have we have illustrations in the book. Everybody is surrounded by angels and the spirits of deceased loved ones and pets as we're transitioning. Everybody, 100 percent of us, regardless of how awful the person was, everybody's spirits pure love. And university-based research has corroborated and validated this. And it shows that 90% of people at the end of their lives and see the spirits of deceased loved ones and pets. So mm -hmm. in my book, I describe what happens. First time I saw it was with my own mother when she was dying in 2002. And I have many, many other stories in the book about families with whom I've worked and, and I'm describing their grandmother, or I'm describing a pet, or I'm describing stories about what their their family member needs in order to go ahead and transition. Mm -hmm. And it's really comforting and joyful and and it really helps people that grieve. Many, many churches and hospice organizations give my book out. I give away thousands of copies of it a year. So anybody that would like a free copy of this, just go to julieryangift.com. J U L I E R Y A N gift.com. And we will send you just say, Hey, I heard you on Ann's show. And we'll send you a free digital and audiobook version of Angelic Attendance and share it with your family members and your friends who have lost a loved one, too. Certainly, you're welcome to buy the paperback if you want, but feel free, free to share the link as well because it brings so much comfort to people. The, there's, I find that there's a lot of information out there about grief and the afterlife and near death experiences, but not so much information available and about what's happening when somebody's dying. And that's something that we're all afraid of. It, I was going to say that's probably the biggest. And even when we are a caregiver of somebody who's dying, we always want to put on that brave, stoic face like Mr. Happy Bunny and hope there's always hope instead what i've been doing is recommending recommended to my clients is that they have that open and honest conversation with a person how are you feeling are you scared is it fearful what's going on for you so that you can share and open up what's coming up for you and to me that is a way of creating intimacy and not having any of those I wished I had of conversations. Absolutely. And ask them, are you seeing any deceased relatives yes. or friends? Are you seeing angels? Are you seeing pets? Because a lot of the time the dying person is reluctant to share that because they don't want the family to think they're nuts. Yeah. And furthermore, for the family, be open. When your grandmother says she's seeing her mother who's been dead for a hundred years, then no, she is seeing her grandmother. That is not, she's not hallucinating. That is not the morphine talking. Yeah. And how you tell the difference between uh, hallucinations and visions, again, 90% of people see their deceased loved ones in visions and dreams at the end of life. How you tell the difference is it's comforting for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's a hallucina hallucination, they're going to be agitated. It's going to be scary for them. Whereas when they're seeing their mother, or in one case, there was a man who was in his nineties, he was dying. His mother died when he was five, but he could smell her perfume in the room. Okay. And he found that so comforting. And that's what the research shows. So be open as a family to know, okay, grandma's got one foot in the spirit world. She's got one foot in the human world. 
how wonderful that she's able to combine the two. And the other really important thing to remember is nobody ever dies alone, ever. Mm -hmm. We're surrounded by angels and the spirits of deceased loved ones and pets, multitudes of them. Yeah. Oh, what a comforting thought. I've got chills all around me. (laughs) It's wonderful. Julie, thank you so very much for being our guest on this, how to navigate the holidays and why we find them so triggering. I do hope, listeners, you found some comfort and solace in what we've been sharing. And give it a wee go. Talk to your loved one. And remember, it's that very first thing that pops into your head. Share it with me. I'd love to hear what's come up for you. You know how to find me, Anne at understandinggrief.com. Julie, we'll make sure we put the your link to your gift. Thank you so much for your generous offer in the show notes so people can go there and uh, pop on and find it. So once again, happy Thanksgiving, many blessings, and I'm so grateful that you honored us again on the show. It's been wonderful, Julie. Thank you. My honor. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye, listeners. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at understandinggrief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.